Jorn, um, you can start sharing your screen whenever you want. Yeah. Uh, so welcome and uh, good morning or uh, what it is uh, where you are. Um, we uh, we have demands from uh, donors and from uh, developments uh, within uh, our field of work uh, to um, innovate and uh, to adapt our programming. And uh, innovation is adaption to reality. Everyone does it uh, in camps. You see uh, the tomato man uh, three days after a disaster, setting up a hairdresser sign and planting his first vegetables. There will be a tomato man in every 30th tent. All the tools and the guidance uh, we have um, to manage these camps and settlements are, are worth about uh, 25% and the rest of what we do is adaptation to a local reality. And in reality, adaptation and innovation is uh, the name of the game for a camp manager. In this session, we uh, will dive into the topics uh, you need to solve and how to work on them. And uh, I was thinking first we could uh, hear from uh, Tommy, who takes his experience from the Global Alliance for Urban Crisis, Palestine, Nepal, uh, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and, and the architect business uh, on how sustainability and environment uh, may be included in planning of displacement settlements and responses. Uh, but... Um, I just want to start with a quick uh, story because uh, uh, to bridge uh, with Nigeria, uh, I was there with uh, Margot Bars, the, the only cluster coordinator with a proper Jedi name. Uh, and she and I came out of a meeting with Nema in Abuja and decided to go for the West African pride, the street fish. We had a really good evening, and uh, when I woke up the next uh, morning, uh, I turned on the news and opened my eyes. And the first thing I saw was uh, Boko Haram uh, taking the responsibility for poisoning truckloads of fish uh, to Abuja, uh, leaving many dead and uh, many more in uh, heavy pain. So I, um, I called uh, Margot and uh, could confirm that uh, our fishing. Uh, went quite well that uh, the night before but uh, it's a it's a point showing that innovation is so much easier if you're a terrorist group so how can we explore our ideas uh, so uh, let me then share this quick thought because everyone that's been uh, exposed to all this um, uh, innovation uh, thoughts and uh, and uh, courses and trainings that we all have know that uh, it is about addressing uh, the needs of the people and uh, to see what you have to work on, what constraints you have, whether they are economical or political or environmental or conflict related. And uh, those constraints may define how you may work. But of course, uh, from my perspective, it's really to base it on the grassroots approach and uh, define who we're creating this value for and uh, and uh, to it all the way to how do we know that this is actually about creating a value in our context. Uh, I think uh, to start off, uh, Tommy. Hello. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi, Tommy. Hi. Good to see you. 
Good to see you. It's of course my uh, share screening. That's uh, the problem. Voila. Um, yeah. You want me to? Uh, so I've been asked to do a, a quick uh, presentation on uh, NEAT. Uh, so you want me to just do this, uh, Jorn? Yeah, to kind of uh, analyze uh, the needs and uh, the impact uh, on our interventions. Uh, I hope for you to enlighten us a little bit with regards to the sustainability and uh, environmental aspects and, uh, and also give a quick brief on, uh, on the developments of NEAT. Yeah, um, so... I'm um, I'm uh, at uh, this time working with uh, NEAT to support them uh, uh, on developing this tool for urban context. So this tool is at the moment just uh, developed for rural areas. So I will just start by by giving a quick uh, explanation of what the NEAT is. So NEAT is the Nexus Environmental Assessment Tool uh, and is an environmental screening tool that allows humanitarians to quickly identify and prioritizing environmental concerns uh, associated with the, the planned projects. So it's, it's a tool to assess uh, environmental aspects, basically. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, you have a presentation there. Oh, yeah. Are you sharing the screen now, Jorn? Or... No, sorry, I was uh, just uh, quickly showing it. Uh, so oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm off sharing. I was, uh, okay. No, I don't, I don't, uh, so <laughs> a lot of this work is going on in Excel these days. So I didn't uh, find it so useful to, to bring up my Excel sheets to, to show that to you guys. Uh, but anyways, uh, so NEAT gives organizations a snapshot of environmental uh, vulnerabilities in their operations and can highlight environmental risks that is associated with specific activities, uh, like water, sanitation, hygiene, food security, livelihoods, and of course, shelters. Uh, so this information uh, does not only provide like insights on how to mitigate environmental risks, but it also can be used for triggering interests in environmental issues uh, towards advocacy and fundraising purposes. Uh, and the tool is supposed to not uh, require uh, environmental expertise to use, so it's, it should be very easy. So if any member of the project team should be able to understand it and use it and uh, present their reports to their teams and to their organizations. Uh, so just quickly on how it, it works when you're in the field and uh, you want to use this, this tool is, um, so you first gather an answer a set of questions uh, through the Kobo platform, if, if you're familiar with this, or you can directly uh, use uh, Excel sheets um, and then insert about like the local environment, the affected area, and this then will automatically generate uh, an Excel report uh, with the snapshot of the current sensitivity of the local environment and highlights underlying uh, vulnerabilities. So this tool is not meant to uh, assess a, a big city, it's more uh, for specific areas um, and contexts. And this can also be done, so, so the first part of the tool is to get like this overall understanding of the environments, uh, and this can be done as a standalone questionnaire, uh, but then you can choose or, or you can follow this by sector specific models. Uh, depending on what activities uh, that you're planning. So the sector specific models that you will find in the existing, uh, in the needs is like shelter, wash and food security. Uh, and we're also now developing a livelihoods one for, for the urban. Um, so if the sector specific models also are completed, then uh, activity specific risk information will be overlaid to provide a second report identifying potential environmental risks uh, of specific humanitarian interventions. Um, so the results of getting these reports can be a basis for a mitigation plan uh, as an advocacy tool uh, for securing or protesting technical support uh, or funding for risk uh, identified. 
Um, so the need was developed uh, by the coordination of assessments for environments in humanitarian action joint initiatives, uh, a multi-stakeholder project aiming to improve uh, coordination between environmental and humanitarian actors. Uh, so the need was, as I said, originally developed uh, as a tool uh, principally for rural displacement context. But now in 2020, in partnership with UNHR Brazil, uh, the NEAT tool is in the process of being adapted for uh, an urban context. So this has been worked on for a few months now and will be piloted uh, in uh, both Brazil and Colombia this coming weeks. We have some, uh, some issues <laughs> with sending uh, the technical experts from Europe because of the COVID situation. Uh, but anyways, Mike Viggins, a technical expert, uh, is leading the development of the urban needs. Uh, and in addition, he has the support of a working group uh, with uh, experts from various organizations and with various backgrounds uh, that is reviewing and giving inputs uh, along the way on the various models as we develop them. So I'm part of the project uh, representing NRC on the working group reviewing. And I'm also supporting the development of the urban planning and shelter related models. So as Jörn said, I'm, I'm an architect and I'm, I've done uh, quite a bit of like shelter and, and settlement planning. Um, so, so yeah, I'm doing, giving my expert opinions and writing this, uh, this specific model. Um, yeah, uh, so that's the, the urban need. Hopefully by the end of this year, we will have it adapted to, to urban. Um, this of course, uh, uh, big and some differences between urban and rural and hopefully we will be able to kind of uh, make this tool also efficient for, for the urban context. I'm sure some of you uh, are more, more experienced than me with, with this tool. I have never tested a tool myself in the field. Um, but uh, hopefully my, my work on the urban part will be, be useful when, uh, when we launch the new version. So yeah, thank you, Jern. That's- uh... Great, uh, and uh, thanks a lot to you, Tomer. We uh, look forward to uh, the new urban need on a communication platform near you. And, uh, and I hope that it will be a useful tool for all of you. Uh, responding. Uh, now uh, over to Egil Eriksen from uh, Engineers Without Borders. He uh, works with the uh, Clever Minds, private partners and uh, well-established NGOs to make a difference that uh, makes a difference in people's life. Uh, please engage with your immediate thoughts and reactions in the chat. Uh, be open and aware that uh, based on your input, the development of new solutions will be addressed through a series of workshops next week. So, uh, Egil, please show us. Thank you very much, Jörn. Uh, let's see first if I can set up screen sharing from my side. Um, are you able to see my screen at this point? With yeah. the presentation? Mm. Yep. Looks let's good. See. Slide shows. Um, can you see the presentation only? No, see your notes the, as well. Notes ah. as well. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the way it goes. Let's see if this is better. Okay. Voila. Great. Um, so, everyone, my name is Egil. Uh, I'm a project manager with Engineers Without Borders Norway, and um, I'm leading. Uh, humanitarian innovation project that's funded by Innovation Norway and the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, the Waste for Warmth project seeks to, to use plastic waste to make insulation products for warm and safe shelters and providing work opportunities for displaced people. So we're trying to, to have a triple output with our project on uh, both providing insulation, providing relief uh, and uh, solutions for waste streams, and also providing work opportunities. So the Polyfloss uh, factory, um, which is our private partner, leads on uh, specification design, engineering, and production of their 
Polyfrost machine that I'll get back to in a minute. And um, uh, they also help us with designs for formatting this material for insulation products. We also partner with the IFRC Shelter Research Unit, um, who supports the research and development, um, and with NGO Field Ready, who contributes with their expertise on local manufacturing in disaster affected areas. So my organization, Engineers Without Borders, we are project leads and coordinate uh, participation of engineers and, uh, and all of our private partner network uh, resources. Now, I'm not a, a CCCM professional, so bear with me if, uh, if any of these, uh, this presentation is a little bit lacking or the terminology is a little off, uh, but we're seeking your input as, uh, as you're mentioned. Um, so obviously you know the situation all, all too well. Um, uh, with uh, winterization of uh, shelters in cold climates, uh, and current approaches to this, they, they rely a lot on um, distribution of blankets, stoves, and fuel. Uh, and this is obviously a, both a cost and a logistical challenge uh, and, uh, and often relies on shipment of material from afar. So distribution of heaters, stoves, uh, and this reliance on fuel increases the cost for refugee families. And there is a huge safety risk associated uh, with, with fires as well, as we know. Um, and obviously these uh, refugee camps are, also produce a lot of plastic waste. Um, so this is an attempt at a solution to, to address, at least in parts, um, more of these issues at once. So our project, um, the Waste for Warmth Partnership, is set up to develop and test this new approach to shelter winterization by making tent insulation in the field. And that insulation will be made from recycled plastic using technology called polyfloss. Um, and this is a mass of thin pipe fibers that resembles candy floss. Um, now these uh, polyfloss machines will be deployed on site where the insulation is needed um, and also provide work uh, and livelihood opportunities for, for displaced people. Um, to give you a little bit more of a, an insight on the, the machine we're developing and that has been developed over the last eight years, um, this polyfloss machine, it heats and spins uh, plastic chips into a mass of thin fibers that resemble candy floss, as I mentioned, and then this uh, would trap air between the fibers and give insulating properties. Uh, the material has been measured in lab to have very similar insular qualities as uh, uh, rock wool and other glass-based insulation. So we're uh, in our project looking for, um, looking to find safe applications of these products. Uh, so we're currently developing uh, floors, um, mattresses, wall panels to, to um, insulate existing shelters. Um, and with the lack of any opportunities to travel in the foreseeable future, our uh, products are currently developed and tested in Paris, in Oslo. Um, and we're, we're very much aware of the shortcomings of this approach and would like to to have work closer to the field and in collaboration with actual users and uh, professionals uh, to just to ensure that the product and, and production really fits uh, a local need. Um, let's see. So um, with this, we, we obviously have a few needs in our, our project today. And I thought I'd, I'd share a few of these with you. Um, hoping to get some, some immediate feedback. Um, so we have a few research needs on insights and current uh, shelterization, uh, shelter winterization efforts. Uh, we're also looking to get more information on, uh, on existing plastic recycling initiatives that we would need to partner with for our, uh, our approach. And um, uh, we're also love to get feedback on the, the proposed insulation products that we will be uh, developing further next week in a workshop here in Oslo and Paris. 
Um, uh, but then coming up after really developing prototypes of our products, we're also looking to, to partner with someone to set up live production of uh, material in the field and hopefully integrate this with uh, existing plastic recycling initiatives. So uh, another central challenge for our project is to, to develop and test um, local small scale business approaches for, for this small scale production um, and, and to explore how this can be integrated with, uh, with livelihood programs in the camps. Uh, and with that, I think uh, I'll, I'll turn back to Jörn, but also open uh, for, uh, for any questions from your part and hopefully some, some uh, valuable input to our project. Yeah, and uh, thanks a lot, uh, Egil. Um... I'm sure uh, our people have uh, a lot of questions and uh, that is really what we're looking for because uh, as every year we know that winter is coming and uh, from my perspective I think that there are a lot of op other opportunities uh, related to this project and, um, and I think that uh, we also need to address it from uh, what are your needs and uh, are you prepared for winter and for flooding? Are the uses of this system uh, uh, something that you can see as useful in your context? Uh, and, uh, and what are the tools to assess how to implement uh, solutions like this? Because uh, we need to benefit <laughs> maybe also from the COVID situation that uh, some of us are extremely near and in daily operations so that we become blind from daily needs but then some of us are also quite remote from uh, operations so we become blind from the products we're engaged in developing and to to close that uh, blind zone we need to have you contributing with the, your perspective and um, and the reflections around this so so yeah, uh, let me just uh, give a quick picture of uh, the full social impact of uh, these kinds of uh, solutions because uh, every physical infrastructure that we implement in a camp setting has uh, an effect on the social infrastructure. If we set up... Uh, drainage systems uh, which could also be uh, another use of uh, this polyfloss technology that uh, could uh, isolate uh, plumbing they could uh, build dividers in uh, or drainage uh, uh, and uh, and they could also ensure uh, better floor tiles that uh, that uh, both uh, produce uh, insulation but also leverage tents uh, to to prevent flooding uh, and then uh, installations like this may also function as uh, social barriers between uh, between uh, parts of the camps that are segregated or uh, perhaps uh, if you have tension with host communities uh, it could be installations that has some kind of protective effect so please uh, come in with your um, input and uh, we will bring that into uh, developing uh, new and relevant solutions uh, should we see um, a quick uh, round on the chat uh, so uh, from Brian, uh, what volume of plastic are these uh, machines capable of producing? Thank you. That's a, a relevant question. Um, so we're working with uh, obviously a, a, a production resource planning around this. Um, current outputs um, that has been proven are... Um, at around uh, well, somewhere between two and five kilos per, or one and five kilos per hour by machine. Um, uh, 
but in terms of volume, that turns into quite a lot uh, for uh, um, yeah for these outputs. Um, and we're also um, currently developing in Paris uh, a new machine and the output goal there that we 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 think we will uh, achieve by the end of this year is a is a 10 kilograms per hour output mm. thanks a lot um and uh, yeah just a comment on that because uh, we also see that when we do proper waste management and separate uh, the different materials we also uh, increase the understanding and the use of other materials. So when we separate plastic, we see that people are more uh, aware of uh, the wood uh, waste that is um, generated and, uh, and it uh, enables a, a more regenerative approach uh, as described in the sustainable settlements that we will uh, dive deeper into on uh, on the session on um, on the 10th uh, but uh, Pierre great to see you and uh, your question is uh, for a, a video maybe we could uh, after the next phase of uh, development uh, give a, a short presentation video uh, of what uh, what the uh, possible uh, uses of these are and and of course all your questions will then uh, very much inform the process forwards uh, i have a lot of questions i i'm really interested in seeing how it can uh, work uh, with regards to flooding challenges and how it uh, can work uh, with regards to livelihood opportunities and, uh, and all of these things. So, so I'm looking forward to that. Thank you, Pierre. Yeah, I, I just uh, noted in the chat as well, there's a link to um, our partner, the Polyphos factory, which includes a video of this, this machine in action. And just to be precise, the machine produces then this uh, candy floss like material and then uh, it's it's up to us to kind of mount the production line to uh, to uh, to format uh, these pieces into insulation products so that's outside of the, the machine um Joran, uh, Egil and Tommy you have one minute so if you want to deliver any last uh, key message yeah um we have posted some links and uh, I'll post uh, another one, but uh, please uh, dive into the sustainable settlement publication that's in the NORCAP uh, shelter, camp shelter and urban uh, link. Uh, and uh, it gives you a lot of uh, information on how to assess different kind of uh, solutions. It gives you a kind of philosophical platform and the methodology to assess it and a lot of interesting examples. Uh, and uh, please come in with, to Egil and Tommy with all your uh, concerns and uh, reflections. And, uh, and we look forward to taking this uh, to the next step. And uh, keep in mind that innovation is adaptation in our work on camps. Thanks a lot to all of you. Thanks. Thank you very much to the three of, our, of you.